There are certain groups of people who pay large amounts of money to have pain inflicted on themselves. They get a sort of weird kick out of the pain that doesn't seem right to the rest of us. Then there's Dark Souls fans. They also pay money to have pain inflicted on themselves. They also get a weird twisted pleasure out of the pain that doesn't seem right to the rest of us either. Since it was released back in 2011, Dark Souls has become a genre-defining game, just like titles such as Independence Day, the official video game of the movie, had before it. It cemented From Software as a top-tier developer, and introduced fans to the repairs department of both Microsoft and Sony, after smashing their controllers against the wall. But what is it about the game and its wider series that people love so much? Is it the smooth frame rate? Great in-game camera? Or the charismatic lead character? There was a time back when video games looked like this that games were really difficult. They were designed on purpose to be tricky, harsh and unforgiving, with the aim of killing the player, running down a timer or slowing them down with difficult or obtuse puzzles. There were two main reasons that video games were designed like this. The first is that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, many video games were ports from arcade titles. They were made hard to force the player to spend as much money as possible. Every death by the player could earn the arcade cabinet another 10 pence or 10 cents, or whatever foreign coins you had near you at the time. And so games were made a little trickier to make sure the machine was successful financially, and it justified the valuable floor space that it took in the arcade. The second main reason that games were harder 30 years ago or so was a limitation of the hardware. Let's not forget that in the early 1990s, games were at most only a few megabytes in size. Back in the 8 and 16-bit era of video games, space on a cartridge or floppy disk was at a premium, so adding in more levels and making bigger worlds might not have been possible. To ensure a game lasted longer than 20 minutes, the difficulty of the game was artificially inflated to ensure the experience was a suitable length to justify the £40 or $60 asking price. Another way of looking at this is that video games today are just exceedingly easy to make them accessible to as wide an audience as possible, and the video games back in the day weren't really that hard at all. That all changed however in 2009, when a video game was released that had a beautiful gameplay system, a beautiful world based on a beautiful concept. That was James Cameron's Avatar, the official video game of the official motion picture, but also that year something else came out that was called D Demon Souls. Demon's Souls was created by From Software of Japan. They were not too well known at the time, but had seen some success with their Armored Core franchise, dating back to the original PlayStation. Creating a high fantasy action RPG game was seen by some as a risk for them at the time, and the game did run into some early issues, as it seemed to lack a true creative vision. That was until Hideataka Miyazaki became involved, and he saw a spark of hope in creating an action RPG game with a high difficulty. Miyazaki and his team believed that if players had to overcome seemingly impossible odds and unbeatable enemies, they would become attached to the feeling of success after finally defeating difficult foes. To be honest, it couldn't have gone It was a complete disaster. Early demos of the game were ridiculed for being too hard, and many assumed that the game was just simply broken. So much so that Sony actually refused to publish the game outside of Japan. Fast forward to the game's launch and a combination of word of mouth and the emergence of YouTube, and the game found its audience. It was released a few months later in Europe and North America, and despite the fact that the game was hard, it sold better than expected. That was partly down to the fact that the game was being used as a badge of honour. With Sony holding the rights to Demon's Souls, a follow-up game would have to be a new IP in its own right. From Software created this and replaced the setting, lore and name of Demon's Souls with a game that for legal purposes is different but it's basically 90% the same. And that game, something called Dark Souls? By 2011, when Dark Souls was released, many fans of its predecessor were craving more of the tough gameplay they'd grown to love so much. But due to the better than expected sales of Demon's Souls, publisher Namco Bandai had an increased confidence that Dark Souls could become a commercial success too. So, armed with the unique idea of making a load of cash, they invested more money into the marketing and PR for Dark Souls, so editorial previews and press adverts became commonplace throughout 2011. With the increased anticipation, this meant the audience for the game was maybe bigger than it would have naturally been. People like me, who had grown up with slower JRPGs and Western third-person action games, were lured into the world of Lord Run because of the hype. But looking at the trophy information for the original PlayStation 3 release, it shows that only about half of the players even made it as far as Anor Londo. 
I first played Dark Souls in July 2012 and played about two hours of it before I realised that it just definitely wasn't for me. It was far too hard. I lit my first bonfire, I acquired the Estus Flask and I even made it to Firelink Shrine before I completely fell off the game and didn't play it again for another month, probably going to play some annual sports title or third person cover shooter. A month later I joined one of the Covenants, it's, uh, it's the one that's like two seconds walk away from Firelink Shrine. And then my time with Dark Souls was done. I never even made it to the Taurus Demon. But of course, I went back. Years after I had dipped my massive big fat toes into Dark Souls, I ventured into Yharnam in Bloodborne. Again, I started the game, played a few hours, and then stopped playing it for about a year, just as I had done with Dark Souls before it. At this point, you're probably thinking that this doesn't sound like the actions of a hardcore Souls fan, and that I probably shouldn't have brought this up. But about a year later, when my son was born, for a few months I'd found myself awake late at night with disturbed sleep. Something about the dark world of Bloodborne drew me back. I didn't really have a desire to finish the game, but just to play something that looked nice, and it wouldn't matter if I died a lot if I wasn't paying attention, because that's kind of expected in that game anyway. But within a couple of weeks I'd finished Bloodborne. It went from a game that was gathering dust on my shelf, to one of my favourite ever PS4 games. So now we skip forward another year or two, and a certain global virus of unknown origin was released, so, uh, sorry, created, sorry, um, came out of a man f***ing a bat, and we all had lots of time locked in our homes. So, one night after watching the 463rd box set of Lockdown, I remembered playing Dark Souls on the PlayStation 3 all those years before, and started playing. Only now, after finishing Bloodborne, I understood that dying was part of the process. You don't get through a Souls game in a single life, but, oh, okay, some f***ers do. But dying is just something you have to live with. Oh, okay, alright, die with, I guess, whatever. I was now more patient with Dark Souls. I knew that sometimes you had to be slow, block, or roll away. Well, actually, you basically complete the game by rolling away from literally everything that you see. I made it through the early part of the game, beating bosses, upgrading my character, exploring the world, and I was really loving my time with the game. I'll not go into the specifics of what happened to me in An Orlando, as it almost cost me my mental health, an Xbox One controller, uh, and my marriage, but let's just say that I almost killed Ornstein and Smo on my third attempt, then I was one hit away on my fourth try, but having got progressively worse and worse through sheer frustration, it took me about another 50 attempts and 5 more hours, whereby at 3am I had to leave it until the morning, as I was physically shaking with anger and I couldn't continue. If you've made it this far into the video, there's a good chance you've either just fell asleep in front of the television, in which case, thanks very much for the extra watch time. Failing that, it might be because you too have experienced the same emotions as the rest of us when you're playing Dark Souls. Emotions that include... Anger. Pain. Fear. We love that feeling when we first saw a new area, and that feeling of finding a chest or shortcut was just so satisfying. I'm sure everyone has been down to their last slither of health, with no Estus flask uses left, and then we suddenly saw the warm, soothing glow of that next bonfire. It's these experiences that we all remember from our first playthrough of Dark Souls, and the rose-tinted spectacles that we use somehow make us forget the times when we literally wanted to smash our head into a wall, break the disc in half, or simply just cry. But we made it. We battled on. We got through to the end. We got through to those plim plim plons that battled with Gwyn. And it made us think that actually maybe we're the villain in this story and it stirred up a whole range of emotions. But whatever emotions you went through during that final battle, I guarantee nearly everyone had the same thought. They tried to make a deal with themselves. You swear that you will never pick up that fucking stupid game ever, ever again. But you still did. Dark Souls, for many, was the answer to the problem of every other game being a first-person shooter or a third-person cover shooter. And the games that didn't fall into some sort of shooter category were either annual sports titles, Final Fantasy games, or made by Nintendo. The early 2000s saw the birth of the quick-time events, and by 2011, every game was a series of watered-down interactions, with very little challenge. But Dark Souls was different. It was hard and required your full attention while playing. Even basic enemies in the game could kill you if you weren't on your game. 
It wasn't due to bad design or game breaking bugs. It was purposely designed to be like that. Every time you were killed by an enemy and went through that frustration and anger, there was a dev somewhere sitting in Japan who'd worked on the game, laughing to himself, knowing that he deliberately caused you to be going through these emotions. And likewise, every time you defeated a boss or found a shortcut or made it to the next bonfire, they were, uh, well, I don't really know what they were doing. It's not like they were watching you through your window, was it? Come on. My experience of Dark Souls is quite different to a lot of people as I played it so long after the original release. But as soon as I'd finished the game, I started it again immediately with a different build. Then a little later, I got Dark Souls remastered for Christmas and started that again right there on Christmas day. And I completed it. This time, it wasn't a gruelling 80 hour experience, but took me less than 12 hours from start to finish. And for those of you who had the remastered game, you'll know that it comes complete with the DLC. The DLC contains some of the hardest bosses in the Dark Souls universe. A massive dragon, a weird lion, dragon, dog thing, and manageable, but then... Knight Artorius the Abyss Walker is brutal. Fighting him made me wish I'd never started the DLC at all and I just left the f***ing game alone. But even after the 25 or so attempts it took me to beat him and all of the frustration and all of the anger, I did it. It felt like I'd actually achieved something. Just to confirm, I'd actually achieved nothing. I was sat in my house, on my sofa, and the only physical exertion I'd done is moving my hands around when I was shouting, this game is f***ing stupid. Then the DLC is wrapped up with what many consider to be the toughest boss in the game. Some also put it in their top 5 hardest bosses across all the Soulsborne games. Personally, I still f***ing hate Ornstein and Smo, but you know, that's more about what they did to me. But again, after 20 or so attempts, many deaths, much walking through the dark and across that f***ing little bridge and down into the cave, he was defeated. I had beaten the final, f final, Final? Final boss? And it's that feeling that you get which is why Dark Souls draws us in and makes us all love the game so much. Even if we had a bad experience with the game, found a boss really tough, or even if we never managed to finally complete it, the game is still loved for the way it decided on an approach to gameplay, and it stuck with it. No compromises, no difficulty selection added in, no patches to balance things up, no training mode. It was tough and it made no excuses for that. And this made the small successes that you achieve within the game all the more rewarding. Dark Souls 2 and 3 followed up the first game a few years later. Some would say the charm of its interconnected world was gone by Dark Souls 2, and some would say the sequel somehow looked worse, had stupid bosses, and got harder the worse you played due to the f***ing effigy mechanic. Whatever your thoughts are on Dark Souls 2 or 3 or the other Souls-like games, the imitations and the parodies and the rip-offs, one thing is for certain, you will never ever forget your first play through the original Dark Souls. You'll never forget the first time you threw your control at the wall. You'll never forget the first time you punched your sofa in anger. And you'll never forget when your neighbours came up to you the day after you were shouting at 3 o'clock in the morning and asked you why you were saying <laughs> that late at night. But that's just Dark Souls. We've all been there, we've all experienced it, and we wouldn't change it for the world. We'll see you next time.